Here we go, yo, 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 what up, though, Smooth Vega, Texas Gatekeeper, we back, man, how you doing? It's Gatekeeper season, man, it's, the, it's only right I come on here, man. Hey, man, welcome back to Mogul State of Mind, bro, I'm glad you came here, Gatekeeper season, and I had a few of your fellow Gatekeeper peers come and sit down and talk about the Gatekeeper list. In fact, I interviewed Sean. Yeah, I saw and, that. And Sean said he don't like getting put on the list, like, don't put me on the list, he was like, um... He don't feel like he's bigger than Texas, but he feel like if you're going to be a Texas gatekeeper, you're somebody who's passionate about folk, pretty much focusing on Texas. And he's thinking bigger than Texas itself, man. How, how do you feel about the Texas gatekeeper list? I mean, I think that that's a two-part answer. Uh, yeah. For me, like, do I care? I would say that for me, anytime I could get, you know, my just do, my credit, my recognition, you know, give it to me, man. I want yeah. it. You know, I'm, I'm at a point in my life right now where, you know, the filter's off, bro. Like, I want my motherfucking credit. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? I want my motherfucking credit. I'm going to talk my shit now. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, credit to you guys. Uh, credit to uh, Dallas Global. You know what I'm saying? You guys, uh, you know, you took time to recognize me. So I appreciate yeah. that. You know, and I do agree with his perspective in regards to, like, you know, giving, being passionate about it. Like, if you're passionate about... Texas, if you're passionate about just growing in general, like this should be for those people. Yeah. And I consider myself one of those people. I'm very passionate about it. Now, the second part of that is, in a lot of ways, with all due respect to the to the people on the list, right? I feel about the list the way that Big D feels about religion. The way you feel about God <laughs> is the way I feel about these deck these these people that y'all put on the gatekeeper list. Ninety five percent of them aren't gods, mm. and, and what I mean by that is they're not. A lot of the people, and and I don't because I don't want to like sit here like I'm fucking with these people, right? Yeah. A lot of them don't really do what people think they can do, right? And see, mm. this is the thing about me, bro. I grew up only wanting to do music. I didn't grow up wanting to. You know, do anything else. This isn't a fucking hustle I inherited. You know what I'm saying? This isn't some shit that just fell on my lap and then it get, mon a get money schemed to me. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. So for me, it's it's one of those situations where when you look at it from that perspective, right? I don't know if you can hear the door. Oh, uh, you cool, man. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's one of those situations for me because it's something that I work my whole life towards. Like, I, I take the shit real serious. Yeah. And I do, I do believe that there's a community of people, right? Like, if you really think about the music community in general, whether it's Texas, whether it's the U.S., whatever, it doesn't matter. It's not really as big as people think that it is, right? The community is broken up into sections. And, and for the most part, these communities have pockets, and there are specific communities that have more influence than other communities, if you catch my drift, yeah. right? I believe that there's a lot of people that will sit here and try to make you believe that there's certain people that are the next step to the next step, mm. right? And a lot of those people, with all due respect, will get exposed in a corporate setting. They'll get exposed in a corporate meeting. They'll get exposed in a record label meeting. They'll get exposed, meaning they're not really capable of doing what they're, they're doing. Because, again, going back to what I said a little while ago, right? It's a little distracted, which is, this is a this is a hustle they inherited. This isn't mm. something they worked towards, right? It just fell on their lap. What, what do you mean by fell on their lap? Who are you talking about? I think it applies to a lot of different people. Mm. You know what I'm saying? When I say falls, fa falls on their lap, it's not something that they worked towards. You know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, you know what? I inherited a rapper, and now I'm a manager. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you didn't really want to be a manager. You became a manager because you inherited a rapper. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, like... How can you really manage? And then I, I question like the level of passion that some of these people have, right? Because like how passionate are you truly about this? So if you're not really passionate about this and you're a non-passionate motherfucker, right? Yeah. You got all these young guys, man, all these young guys that are coming in the game, right? They're all looking for a way in. They're all looking for someone that they can hold on to, like, you know, gravitate towards and, you know, whatever, pay services, whatever mm -hmm. it may be, right? These young kids that are like filled with passion, what you start seeing is a lot of these non-passionate motherfuckers, right, that are in position or that people are telling you that are in position. Yeah. 
trying to talk to these people that are passionate. Like, how can a non-passionate motherfucker teach a passionate motherfucker? Well, let me push back a little bit. There's always you. a saying that sometimes, usually the best leaders are the ones who never sought out to be leaders. That's true. And a lot of times, the ones who always trying to lead or always trying to do things to put them in the self in the spotlight turn out to be bad leaders. Sometimes it falling in your lap, that just means it chose you. It ain't, You ain't choose it. You're not chasing it. And sometimes that can turn out good. I agree with you, but I think the counter argument to that, it's also easier for you to quit because it wasn't in you. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, this isn't really something I wanted to do. It's something I made some money off of. Cool, I'm done. I wipe my hands clean and I'm done. But I think what happens is when I say the the the, the argument of the passionate versus the non-passionate, the blind leading the blind, why I say that is because you get a lot of these young artists that are hungry, man. And I'm at a point now where I just want to teach the next generation yeah. of kids coming in like, yo... I understand that y'all, like, this is like when I talk about the religion thing, right? It's all an illusion. It's all an illusion. You guys are are spending money with people that don't really care about your development, your growth. They want to get your mm-hmm. money. And, and and at the end of the day, because it's their hustle, and yeah, in the process, they can move you in specific situations. I watched an interview recently that Dame Dash did, right? Yeah. And he talked about at his peak that, you know, one of the things that he did is he hired a publicist. And the publicist that he hired was there in position to sell celebrity. Yeah. Like he was that that was his goal. Like I wanted to create Jay-Z and uh, you know I wanted to sell a celebrity aspect to. That's because by me selling a celebrity aspect, me paying this person X amount of dollars, it increased his value. Fast. Right? So I think a lot of what you're seeing is it's being a celebrity's lifestyle is being sold versus the actual skill set, the traits, the things that actually like are are the things that like make people music executives, per se. So are you saying, and I just want to make sure I'm hearing you cl- clearly, so are you saying that, like, it's people out here who are, who have no interest in actually providing the service that they're getting paid for. They're just using their celebrity or their perceived status to get the money, but they're failing on actually delivering what the person paid for. I would say... Yes and no. I think there's a big portion of that, but I think there's also people that take on clients with the intent to do, but they can't do. They can't deliver the deliverable. You know what mm. I'm saying? Because they're not qualified or capable of delivering the deliverable. But because we're making these- Give me an kids, example of that. Ah, oh man, there's so many different examples. You know what I'm saying? And I think we're going to kind of get to that here in a second, right? Yeah. But I think when we talk about that and we look at that for what it is, and I'm not going to be vague about it. I think what we're what I'm really trying to get to is that I see a lot of young kids get burned out because yeah. Give me an example of that. Like show like give me an example so we can before we continue it so people can see like I think exactly so, a picture that we we're trying that, to. I think there's right so now. many that I, I can't really just come right to mind right now. Like oh, there's this one situation yeah. because I've heard so many horror stories of young kids that come in that spend their money with people that are, that are they're made to believe that are more important than what they actually are, or mm-hmm. that could do things that they can actually they, they can't actually do, and then they lose their money and they're like fuck it, I'm out. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it's it's a very it's a very interesting argument, right? Because I know we're gonna kind of go into different parts of this of this conversation. Yeah. But I think for me, that's kind of what I feel about the list as well. I mean, look, man, at the end of the day, I'm glad that you guys, that, you know, Dallas Global, that you guys are taking time to recognize the people that are, that are, are putting in work. Yeah, breaking Maybe. news about Dallas Global. I don't know if you know, but I did a DNA test and Terry is my son. <laughs> so just breaking news breaking news well you know what I, I appreciate you and your son uh, acknowledging uh, you know because like you, we were talking off camera right now like yeah. what you guys do with that it's, it's, it's interesting and it's really unique and I think it's dope because it's like Madden right every year Madden comes out every year you know certain people's rankings go up right maybe that's how we should do the gatekeeper this year Maybe that's how the gatekeeper list should be. It should be people a put system. everybody from past, all the ones who felt like they should be on it, mm-hmm. everybody that's new on it, and then show their overall gatekeeper power. Like, yeah. hey, you are overall 64 this year. Like, yeah, like give them an overall rating. <laughs> maybe that's how we should do it. Um, but you know what, though? I will say that I don't think people realize that it is a year-to-year thing. And I understand why everybody wants to be recognized and acknowledged. Like, I get it. Yeah. But, you know, as well as I know, bro, people don't care about what you did 10 years ago, well, 10 weeks ago. What have you done for ago, me lately? Or even fucking 10 minutes ago. They care about what you're doing right now. 
And that's kind of where it's at. You know what I'm saying? Your, your fellow gatekeeper, Pierre, um, Alpine, made a comment um, when Sean, when I posted what Sean saying about not wanting to be a gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. And he said, getting put on that list gives people pretty much their expectations is unreal. Like, it just puts so much unneeded pressure on gatekeepers because people's expectations of what a gatekeeper is is just, it's unreal. Do you feel like that? I, I, I do agree that it puts a certain level of expectation on you. You know what I'm saying? Because, again, going back to the, the argument of, like, these young, hungry kids that come in, right, they're all looking for a way. Yeah. And, and when they see a list come out that these are the people that you need to go to, they start going to those people. They jump in all of our inboxes. We all see an influx of messages and potential clients, you know what I'm saying, yeah. even, right? Um, and it does become unrealistic because people do see you as the next step to the next step, right? Yeah. And so, like, I, it's not always pleasant, you know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. if you don't do something for somebody and you, it's not even that you ignore them, but you just don't do it for them, then, you know, then you're whatever. And then they make a big deal about it. And then all of a sudden it becomes what it becomes. Like, but, you know, I, I, I think what I take from it now, uh, from what I've seen, I've been very, very, I think different in the sense of yeah. like, I'm reaching out to a lot of these guys now. Like I recently reached out to Pine. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm trying to close that gap because yeah. I think we all operate in our own worlds and we all bring different things to the table. And I'm at a point now where I don't want to be the guy that has, you know, so much real estate in the live music side or so much real estate over here and so much real estate over here. And I'm just like, yo, it's all mine because that's yeah. what I've been doing. And uh, I want to, you know, share it. You know, obviously I've created a great working relationship with you. You know, I'll hit you up and I'm like, yo, you want these interviews, whatever. Yeah, I sure. want to help you build your platform up because the bigger your platform becomes, the more beneficial it becomes to myself to artists that I'm working with, to people that may be working and breaking the way in because yeah. we we do have to eventually show um, this next generation of talent that comes in a better way. So it's, you know, it's not even so much to make it easier, yeah. but it's just that stuff that we were talking about, like, you know, now the NBA is different. Yeah. You know, people are more, there's there's programs and nutrition programs and science that make the, the, the athlete more, you know, more athletic and more whatever, right? Yeah. So... Uh, those are the things that I look for whenever we talk about the scene right now, you know? Now, you said you reached out to Half Pipe, but Correct. you also reached out to another peer, Correct. Rainwater, mm -hmm. to, to get him on the Smooth Vega podcast. Correct. Shout out to you doing your thing on that, and we're going to touch into it. Um, but Rainwater wanted to charge you Correct. to get on it. And, of course, I brought that up to, well, before I say what he brought up on the interview, you, of course, you told me, like, yo, he tried to charge me this X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. And then you went on a tangent and start yeah. kind of going in that rainwater, which is funny fun. because that's the smooth Vega I knew last year. That's not <laughs> that wasn't his character, but yeah. now smooth Vega now understand the content space yeah. and he's like, "Hey, <laughs> okay, yeah. how, how did you feel when Rainwater tried to charge you?" Look, to get I'm, in? I'm gonna give you a disclaimer. Okay, uh, the disclaimer is going to be anything that I say about Rainwater from this point forward is strictly professional because I don't know him on a personal level. Yeah. I have nothing against him personally. If I see him right now, we're not fighting. I saw I started fucking picking at him on social media and people were fucking like, oh, you know what? You know, why why are you doing that? You know, they're thinking it's the motherfucking bloods and crips. It's the goddamn music industry, right? Yeah. If I see a basketball on a fucking court, I'm a fucking competitor. I will challenge you to a one on one, right? Yeah. If I feel I'm better. In this case, when we talk about this specific instance, it's interesting, right? So you know, I had hit you up several weeks prior. I said, man, you know what? I'm going to start launching this podcast. I got this whole concept. I had already been building the foundation for the podcast. Yeah. And when I say, hey, I'm going to, you know, I want X, Y, Z on the show. Again, because the idea was to start bridging the gap. Yeah. I want to start bridging the gap from my, my world to other people's world because people don't even know some of the stuff that I'm doing. And so, all right, you know what? I'm going to reach out to D. Let's see if you can set it up. You're like, I got it. I end up landing in Detroit. When I land in Detroit, I'm thinking the whole way I'm on the plane. And, you know, when I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the next step. And when I thought about it, I said, fuck it. I'm going to reach out to, to Rain myself. Yeah. Just out of a gesture because it, it, it might be a little bit more personable if it comes from me 
versus from it coming from you. So I reach out to him. I send him a message. Now, the message I send him, it wasn't, I wouldn't say that it was like, oh, man, much love and respect, but it was still like, yo, man, I want I want you to jump on my shit. I got a whole nother angle that I want to work with you. You know, I fuck with you. Let's, you know, come on. And he hit me with just the price. So to me, when I saw that, I was like, all right, you know what? Like, it didn't register to me right away. But then when I, it finally registered, I'm like, again, I don't really care if you feel you're worth that. Like, I'm okay with you feeling that you're worth that shit. You could feel like you're worth $10,000, right? It's the approach. It's the dismissiveness. Yeah. Like, like, you're just sunning me. Like, I'm just some whatever-ass motherfucker. Like, bro, you have no idea how much, how much of an ally I can be for you, right? Yeah. Because the truth is, I wasn't interviewing him or wanting to interview him for viewership, for uh, listenership. I'm good in that department. You know what I'm saying? I'm fucking 41 in the U.S. on Spotify, 49 on Apple. You know what I'm saying? In the whole U.S. Yeah. Right? On top of that, like, professionally, again, I'm not discrediting him. You wouldn't even have been in my top 30 high-profile interviews that I've done. Right? Yeah. I'm just reaching. I was reach legitimately reaching out to you to, to, to bridge the gap because I know he sells services. I know he sells his management services. I know that he has consultations. I get it, bro. It's a grind. It's a hustle. But I also know what I do. I also know what I bring to the table. I also know that I fill some of the gaps and do some of the things that, quite frankly, you can't do. Right? So I felt this was going to be a good opportunity to bridge that gap. Right? It, and in the process, why not get the content? Right? Why not do an interview? But I wasn't going to fucking interview him and talk about Mo 3 or anything like that. Like, I, I, that's already been why, done. Why, but why not? I mean, because you... No, not me personally. That's not the angle that I would have done. You know what I'm saying? It would have been more management-based. It would have been more conversation about his story. That was the initial approach. But when he did that, to me, it was just like, whatever. Yeah. So I thought it through, and I said, you know what? I'm going to call him out. And I'm going to have fun because now it becomes a sport. And again, nothing personal. I'm like, bro, I don't fucking hate him. You know what I'm saying? Like, And I was even like really double, like, you know, second guessing. Like, man, do I even really want to talk about it? And I thought I was like, no, nah, I'm going to talk about it because here's the other part of it. A few a few days later, I said, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. And then I saw your fucking interview clip. <laughs> uh, we are in on this, but a gatekeeper was calling you out recently. Who? My guy Vega. Who was that? Smooth Vega. Oh, the nigga before work? Yeah. Hmm. He wanted me to be on his podcast for free. Yeah. Why would I do that? Why would I do that? Yo, yo, peers, man. They, they can work. It work. Hey, his, uh -huh. his channel got subscribed. Uh, nah, that's cool. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, don't, you should, why you didn't reach out a year ago, two years ago? <clears throat> but he just started the podcast. I understand that. That, that. That's how I feed my family. So you want me to go on your podcast and put on Spotify so, or put on your YouTube to make money off of it and I don't get nothing. <clears throat> right or wrong? That's, that's fair. You know what I'm saying? You want me to go on your shit, talk on your shit, it's for you to make money, and I don't get nothing. I don't get nothing at all. So everybody don't ever start. Ever, ain't nobody ever speak on it. Like, so you mean Timmy Ryan don't get no money? <laughs> and then when I saw your interview clip, you know, he 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 mentioned me, and then he mentioned something about him having more followers than me. And then I was like, oh man, like you're not gonna fucking son me. Is what you're gonna. That's what you're not gonna do. Mm. So then I took again. You saw what I did on social media. I took his numbers, I pulled him, I pulled my numbers side by side. I ran his engagement rate to my engagement rate, right? I'm not even going to sit here and go there, but you know what I'm saying? Like, no, go you, there. You here now? All right, fuck it. We'll go there. Here's what happened. <laughs> I run his numbers. He has 79,000 followers. I have, at the time, 11,400 followers. His engagement rate per, per the calculator on social media was 1 dot, what, 6%. Mine was 38%. Translation off my eleven thousand three hundred followers, I had double the reach off of like sixty seven thousand less followers. That means one or two things: either you have fake followers, or nobody gives a fuck what you're posting, mm. right? That's spicy. No, that's the truth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because the numbers support that. Yeah. But fuck that. Fuck the Instagram because you remove Instagram. God forbid if the internet gods take away the fucking. Instagram away from you, 
What else do you have to lean on? Because you ain't doing it across the board. But see, this is the thing. After he did that, I, I pointed that out. And then guess what happens? Bumpy Johnson, who he manages, reaches out to me. Right mm -hmm. now, I have a, a long-standing relationship with Bump Bumpy. Me and, you know, I don't want to throw Bump under the bus because I already know he's going to be like, smooth, why'd you bring me into this smooth? I love you, Bump. But this has to be talked about. And what it is is that Bump releases this record with Boozy, biggest record of his career. Puts the most money into this song that he's ever put into any other song. Big release. Releases on his YouTube channel. Right? Now, mind you, he had already talked to me. I manage a, I manage a Spotify account. I have access to his Spotify accounts, in case Rain doesn't know that, right? Yeah. Which he probably doesn't. Uh, so the fucking song comes out, hits the fucking YouTube channel. Everybody's excited about it. I'm happy for Bump. I'm proud of him. Yeah. Calls me the next day. Smooth, I need your help. Apparently, when he releases this song on YouTube, right? It was on Boozy's YouTube channel. They did not release it on DSPs, right? So that song wasn't commercially released. Not only was it not commercially released, right? There was something with that beat where it wasn't fully owned. Okay. So the first 30,000 plus views of that song on Boozy's YouTube channel the content ID was going to another song, to another, another, uh, to TuneCore. It was going to another distributor, meaning someone else was collecting the royalties off that record, meaning somebody else was getting paid for those, for those plays. Oh, damn, they eating. Yeah, they were eating. But the problem that I had with that is like, yo, man, this is my, my guy's biggest song to date. On paper, he's on your clock, Rainwater. He's not on mine, right? But guess who he calls to help clean up the problem? That nigga from Fort Worth. Smooth Vega. Vega. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's what we called. And so this goes back full circle. He mentioned that I hadn't reached out to him in the two years. Or why didn't I reach out to him two years ago? Same rules apply. Right? You ain't reached out to me, but we're in the now. Yeah. And so in the now, I did reach out to you. And part of the reason I reached out was not for the fucking interview. I could give a fuck less about the interview. This is a perfect example of where I could have helped you, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to charge me $1,000 for an interview, then I should charge you $1,000 to teach you how to properly release a fucking single for your artist. You know what I'm saying? Because you dropped the ball with that. Now they cleaned it up from what I heard, but that's where we're at with it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? But I ain't got nothing against them. I know it sounds like I'm mad, but I'm not. I promise I'm not mad. This is a little competition. This, he, I, there's nothing he can do better than me. Mm. That's just a heavy statement, okay. There's nothing. And I feel that way. I mean, and as you, you should. I mean, if, if you're going to But, get but you know what? I'm going to tell you something, Dean. I'm going to give you a sound bite. Let's look at the real undertone of this. The real undertone ain't got nothing to do with what I can and can't do. Yeah. It's the fact that Mexicans do not get support in this fucking... They don't... Mexicans don't get respect in this music industry. Right? People, look, I've been saying this for the past 10 plus years. People look at Mexicans in the music industry, Latinos in the music industry, the way that we look at people calling Taco Bell authentic Mexican food. We know it's not real, right? Let's analyze something here for a second, D. Whenever you took me to Boss Talk Radio and I talked to E, he's the homie, number love, right? What did he say whenever we started talking about podcasting? We started talking about interviews. He said, you don't count. You got light skin. Ha, ha, ha. Now, I didn't get bothered by it, but there's truth and humor. And unfortunately, there's people that subscribe to that mentality. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because here's the thing. Fuck all the years I put into it. Fuck, fuck the fact that I've been going hard and, and dedicating my whole life to this. Fuck all the hardships that I had to endure and all the things that I had to overcome. Fuck that. Fuck all of it. You mean to tell me, you mean to tell me, let's dismiss all of it because the color of my skin? You got to be kidding me if you think that it's easy for a Mexican, a Latino in this music industry. We work twice as hard to get half the fucking recognition. I don't get mentioned amongst the platforms locally. Think about it. I've had some high profile interviews. You could, you could attest to this. For sure. You know what I'm saying? You for could sure. attest to the fact I've had fucking strong viewership. Not only that, I've had high-profile interviews. Yeah. But they don't mention me. You know what I'm saying? But by, by, by the numbers, 
Who's put on more local artists on shows over the last 17 years? You know what I'm saying? By the numbers, I've been doing this like when everybody was giving, you know, hailing this person and that person as the big shot promoter in town. Yeah. Where they at now? Why, why do you feel like Mexican artists... It's not just Mexican artists. It's, it's, or Latino yeah. artists get overlooked. I couldn't tell you, man. I think it's it could be a number of things. Because I've never grew up looking at black and brown any different. Because I, I want to say this only because... As sure, black people, we curate the culture. Correct. But we don't make the money off the culture. Like, we, it's fucking like we build the house, but, we get, but somebody else steals the deed. Like, we have no ownership of all the shit that we create. Mm -hmm. So, why do, do you feel like there's a disconnect between the black and brown community? I don't know that Is it's there a... As Kanye say, the Jewish people run the media. Is it a disconnect between the black, the brown, and our Jewish brothers that, you know, so like I'm trying to figure out, because I'm going to be honest, if you are an artist and you get the Latino community, because y'all motherfuckers are loyal. Yeah. Like you, if you get them Latin, y'all support. Like little flip them go on tours, not because mm -hmm. niggas are showing up. It's Hispanics showing up for Lil Flip and all those legacy acts and things of that nature. And it's the value in y'all that if we gain, everybody you know, if we gain the Latino community trust and and and, and we gain y'all your, your, um, attention, you go big. Yeah. So why? Because y'all drive the revenue in content space and music why do y'all feel like y'all left out? Because I feel like we're not, we don't speak out enough. We're, we're cool with, we're cool with being overlooked. I'm not cool with being overlooked. But how are you overlooked when it's dope that your culture is the driver no, of you're, consumerism? You're, okay, so to, to your point, like, you know, I had DJ Paul. When I interviewed DJ Paul, yeah. when I interviewed Bun, they both stated that the Mexican consumers are their biggest consumer base. Facts. Right? We know that. But I still feel that there's, there's an underline, and I can't really just pinpoint it on one thing or another, right? And I think a lot of it is that we got to command that motherfucking respect now. Like, yeah. we got to just sit here and say, nah, this is what it is. I'm not a fucking Mexican promoter. Yeah. I'm not, I'm tired of the half-ass, backhanded compliments, the fucking passive-aggressive, oh, that's the dude on the land side. Yeah. Like, I'm not a, a Mexican music executive. Yeah. I'm a promoter that happens to be Mexican. I'm a motherfucking music executive that happens to be Mexican, Right. Now, when we talk about the artist side of it, there's a there's a lot of variables there, right? Yeah. But when we talk about just generally speaking, the people that are are making moves, it's not a matter of me. Like I don't wake up wanting to get embraced and accepted by anybody like that, right? But I do. I'm at a point. I was like, nah, man, respect what I'm doing. Like I've put my time in. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm gonna I'm gonna command it. When I talk about the shows that I put on and I cringe talking about who I've worked with now. I hate telling you who I've worked with because, because nobody gives a fuck what you did, what I said earlier in the interview. Yeah. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I've seen interviews where you talked about um, when they talk about touring. Yeah. And people be like, man, who else can do that? Me. Vegan. I do that in my motherfucking sleep year round. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 I just don't talk about it because I'm humble about it, right? I'm I'm humble. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, we ain't doing that anymore. Even whenever I sat with you and your son last year, uh, Terry, that is. I'm yeah. not talking about your actual yeah. son. <laughs> no, he's my actual son. <laughs> he's your actual yeah. son. Uh, we talked about the list, and you said, man, we made an argument for pushing you higher, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're just kind of quiet. Speaking of that, so this year, 2023, if we did the gatekeeper list, where should Smooth Vega be at? Man, top five dead or alive. Top five. So we're at in the top five because it's five numbers. My favorite number is three. So, three. <laughs> but I'm cool with four. Why not eight? Eight? Yeah. Oh, man. I I, I don't know, man. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a top five type of guy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Nah, but uh, whatever, man. I'm cool with whatever, bro. I'm fucking with you, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm messing with you, too. I... I, I think this, be careful with black people. And, and, and I'm not saying this like some, some fuck up shit, but I'm saying this because 
we are so critical. Ooh. Anytime it comes to music and athletics, I get it. That's why we don't show up to as many shows. Cause for the black people to show up, you gotta we gotta feel like you doing some exceptional shit. Cause yeah. everybody in your house rap. Yeah. Facts. <laughs> everybody in this mug is spit subpar bars. Everybody think they got a little talent. Everybody think they got af- they're athletic. And so if you're looking for the credit from black people, then you're willing to take on the burden that we have as black people. I wouldn't say it's so much the credit as much as it is that, you know, even the head nod, which is essentially part of the recognition, right? Yeah, you're entering the problem. If right. you want the head nod, we don't even give each other the head No, I, I agree with you. Like, but, nigga, but it's you the same scored thing, 45 but, last night, you should have scored 72. It was the same thing within my culture, right? Because, you know, when I started doing shows mm. and I started branching off and I did more hip hop, I'm putting more money in black artists' pockets than I am. Hispanic artist pocket. Makes sense because yeah. you're not trying to get the black audience. You know your people are going to sell, show up and buy them tickets and buy merch. Mm-hmm. God forbid you buy, book an artist that black people showing up to because <laughs> they probably won't show up. <laughs> I, I hate it, but that's the, just the because we're so overly critical of our talent. But no, I think, look, when we talk about the definition of what y'all put together with this list, right? Yeah. And you say, oh, you know, these are the people that can help you here, here, and here. And, you know, when I talk about certain things that I do, because I do so many, I wear so many different hats. And, you know, um, I said this on Super Tight TV. I said, I found the best at what I do. Yeah. Right? And I don't mean that, like, in an arrogant way. I'm saying that that's how I feel. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I wear a lot of different hats. You know, I, I, I can still get busy as a producer, whatever, cool. But when it comes down to like management, when it comes to even social media management, like I manage a lot of people's social media accounts, I build brands. So, and I'm not working with just local artists. I'm working with national voice. artists. Yeah, I'm working with people with, that have Grammy yeah. nominations under the belt. Like I'm brokering deals for some big motherfuckers, bro. I'm, I'm bridging the gap with labels over here, you know, with people like yourself and other platforms. Like I have fed a lot of platforms, a lot of not only interviews, but content. I've done this year, year, year over year, year around, but I don't ask for that. And it's interesting because when you talk about credit, I had a, I had a conversation with a recording artist one time, right? Mm-hmm. National recording artist, man. And this person tells me, I had, I just simply asked, I said, yo, if I set up a deal for you, how, how do, how do I get my credit off of that? Like, is it cool if I post it? Like, you know, cause I was still kind of like respecting the space. Yeah. I didn't want to step on toes. I didn't want to look like a clout monster. Yeah. I want all the clout, right? The person tells me, nah, you know what? Like, you got to let us do that for you, right? And then I, I I allowed that to happen. And I noticed that as years passed on, if you wait for someone to give you your credit, they will never give you your credit. You know what I'm saying? No, it's a balance for sure. And that's the truth. So if I'm now stating what it is, it's because what it is. You know what I mean? Like the real estate within the live music side regionally. Yeah. Not and we're not talking about locally. Fuck, I don't care about that. People legitimately go through me to get into specific spaces and they don't even know it. Yeah. Cuz they'll go through somebody else that goes through me. Right? So I'm trying to remove the middleman now. So I can create those relationships. So I could be more accessible with the people that need to know that. No, that's important. Because I mean, because it, they don't know. I mean, too, uh, bro. I like money. Oh, we all do. And I, I mean, I get all the humble pie that we need to take and <laughs> lower our sales. But bro, people will step. People, you know, the saying is, "Put a limit on how much you give," because people will never put a limit on how much they take. <laughs> and when you when you constantly eating humble pie, for the person who doesn't eat humble pie, they're benefiting the most. Like, yeah, he's okay with being the the low person behind the yeah, scene. Yeah, for sure. Let me take that credit, and I'm a, and I'm gonna capitalize. And they usually go big. And then when this person really finally ready to come out, he gets to say, "No, it was really me." Everybody, yeah. oh, we don't want to hear that shit because it's not about who's first to do it; it's who's most popular that's doing it. Correct. Which but, is the which is the part that we talked about earlier about yeah. selling the celebrity aspect, which is now where I'm at at this point in my life and the point in my career where like that ain't happening no more. Yeah, it's all coming back to me. I'm focused on on my personal branding. Like 
I'm removing the premier live. It's becoming Smooth Vega, yeah. right? You know, the, the it's not it's not nothing beats expansion anymore. It's the Smooth Vega podcast. So give me the difference between that. Um, cause you, you had the premiere live and you were still in the pro you were still on camera with your guests. Now it's the Smooth Vega podcast. So like what's the difference between premiere? It's really and not podcast? much of a difference aside from like, yeah, we are going into more of a traditional podcast format. Uh, and the conversations are going to be a little bit different. The, the flow of it, the cadence of it's going to be a little yeah. bit different. Uh, but I think honestly, like I've been just perfecting my craft for the last few years to where now I'm comfortable to be like, nah, it's, it's coming to me. Yeah. Yo, dog, I've been I've been serious about this. I've been in the gym. I've been fucking trying to lose weight. I'm trying to lose the shades. I'm trying to go all in because I see the bigger picture. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I, I see some of the, the corporate band, brands that are taking interest already. And I think the thing about the, the, the decision be, between, you know, behind changing the name, the yeah. channel's still the same, is to redirect and to build my personal brand. It's, it's, it's going back to Smooth Vega. Like, you know, people will run and use my clips all yeah. day, every day. You know, you know how this goes, bro. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's happened to you. People will use your clips all day. Like, now they got to give credit to the Smooth Vega podcast. Like, dude, true story, I was in LA. So I went out to Power 106 K-Day, and it was so interesting how different that respect level was when I went out there, right? But one of the conversations that we had was they want to start featuring my content on their morning show, and they want to start introducing me to their to their audience, and they want me to start having my setup at their their big live events or yeah. whatever. It, it's working towards something bigger, but I think it's very important for a branding standpoint for people to be able to identify me, uh, you know. So I think that was the reason behind the name change. So is the premiere segment so? Pretty much the channel is Smooth Vega podcast. Well, right now, the, the channel still Premiere Live TV. That's the last bit of thing that I need to change. Is the premiere setup stage? Like, I know you're going to a traditional for the Smooth Vega podcast, mm -hmm. but the, the premiere live look is that that segment all together is done now. Uh, kind of, sort of. I mean, we're still filming with the same production crew, same studio. Uh, I'm going to still probably do nothing beats experience. Like, like, I'm, like if I do anything on site, Remote yeah. with lobs, I'll probably still call it nothing beats experience. Gotcha. But if, if I do a podcast, if I'm getting 30 to 60 in, it's going to be the podcast. You know what I'm saying? So it all depends on that. But generally speaking, I think now, you know, we're in a game where it's about content. We've been talking about content all day. Yeah. And uh, just figuring out what content works for you, the style of content that, that it is. I think for me, the branding is going to be so important for me to get that in. You know what I'm saying? The As far as the, the, the name, the name change. But... In terms of like my contract and everything that I operate as far as like a, a talent buyer, because I'm still yeah. a promoter, right? Like I, I still do live events. I'm still doing tours. Um, everything's still under Premier Live contractually. Got you. Well, I tell you what, man, I, I just want to give you a flower and say, man, man one, thank you for always helping me, you know, saying when I had to put the, the tour <laughs> together and reach out to venues, I saw you reaching your connection. I had a glimpse to see what you went through as yeah. a minority and how these venues will treat you because you are a minority. Now, I want to thank you for, because believe it or not, we understand the value of black and brown yeah, from the sure. black side. And it was because of you that I was able to tap into a lot more of the Hispanic sides with the Reveries, the um, Crystal Poppins, the Bella. GT Bella Rose, GT Garza, you know, things of that nature. It's because of you that, Connecting me to that side, and hopefully we could continue to build no, for and sure, cross man. pollinate pl platforms to do those things, man. Because I I can't speak on the behalf of black people, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> no, we, we do see the value. No, for sure, we still and and I always say, even though I don't believe in God, I do believe heaven will look like some of everybody, and so I try to create a, a atmosphere as much as I possibly can where it look like heaven where you got people from all creeds, all walks of life, able to be in the space and do what they love. And that's content, creating music, et cetera. No, nah, man, you know, uh, I appreciate you. You know, I anytime I see anybody working hard, bro, I always make sure to reach out. And, I, and I, it might be late, but I'll do it eventually yeah. to extend my arm because I, I, all I want when it's all said and done, right, is to see this grow, yeah. to see the scene grow, to see people grow. I'm into professional development. I love artist development. I love seeing people grow. And if I can contribute to that, I will, right? Yeah. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to bring these people to you because 
some of these artists just want an opportunity and they don't know how to go about doing so. They're intimidated, right? They get intimidated by the idea of reaching out on their own. So anything I could do to help, I will. But lastly, I think it's important to, like you said, like the power and in, in, in understanding that, you know, I like I said earlier, like I've never looked at black and brown different. I grew up in a neighborhood where, you know, I just did it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it, it, like I love, like I love the culture. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I feel like the culture, never mind the fact that, you know, we were part of the inception of it in, in a sense, it's still just like we can grow. And I've always just been really mindful of it. You know, I, I try my hardest to respect, try my hardest to be a contributor. You know, I appreciate you giving me the flowers. And like you said, man, there's so many hardships that I have to deal with, with being a minority promoter. You know, so many things that people don't see, right? Like racism does still exist. Right. I was at... Um, backstage at Jordan Lucas' show and Yella Beezy gets there, right? And they were giving him such a hard time about parking. And it was very obvious why they were doing that, right? So he finally comes in and he goes, hey, man, do you work here? I said, nah, but I'm the promoter. Well, what's good? He said, man, why they always give me a hard time when I come here? They don't give me a hard time anywhere else in the city. They only give me a hard time here. I said, come on, man, you already know the answer to that. He said, what you mean? I said, you already know the answer to that. He says, um, because of the beef? I said, come on, bro. <laughs> they white. And he's like, oh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like I, I've been fortunate enough to be a buffer and a trusted source to kind of be a bridge, but I still deal with it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I still deal with it. And like I when I say I'm mindful, I'll conclude with this, you know. I've never had the word culture vulture associated to my name, at least not that I know of. Yeah. Right? There's no one, no way that anybody could ever create that argument. But I do believe that there's culture vultures within our, our, our community, within our scene, and within just music in general. But I don't think that is limited to just whites. It's, it could be any fucking race. You know what I'm saying? People just trying to suck whatever life they can get out of the culture. And all I want to do before it's all said and done is give back because I want to be able to see this shit grow and I want to be part of the reason why it does. No, for sure. That's all it is, man. I don't want to, I don't want to wait till I'm dead to get my flowers. So I appreciate you giving them to me, man. And top five or else I'm fucking boycotting your list. <laughs> <There> you <laughs> know, hey, I just play with you, dog. No, for sure. Hey, Vega, man. I appreciate you. Appreciate you sitting down. Mogul State of Mind. Y'all go check out Smooth Vega podcast available on Spotify Apple, it's on all DSPs? Yeah, all DSPs. Oh, it's right. DSPs, YouTube. and you can catch the video on YouTube, right? Yes, sir. Hey, man, until we meet again, Vega, I appreciate you, my guy. Thank you. Peace.